So we are uh, very privileged to have uh, Madhav with us. Madhav Kumar, uh, we can also call him Dr. Madhav Kumar. He's a postdoctoral scholar in marketing at the MIT Sloan School of Management. And Madhav is doing some really fascinating work. His work investigates and improves core business strategies such as pricing, targeting, and recommendations in online marketplaces. Uh, methodologically, he blends machine learning and causal inference tools to evaluate and optimize both personalized and system-wide policies. Right? He has some very, very interesting work which he is going to present today. And we are very excited and thrilled to have you with us, Madhav. Thanks a lot again for accepting our, our invite. And I'll hand over the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anish, for the kind introduction as well as for having me. Let me just start um, the presentation. Okay, slides work, right? Yes, please. Awesome. Okay, uh, again, uh, thank you for the introduction, Anur. So this work is on designing large-scale bundling strategies in cross-category retail. And just for everyone's benefit, bundling is basically selling two or more products together at a discount. So that's the setting that we are in. And I'll start with sort of a simple motivational question of why this is important. So consider a retailer, an online retailer, it has an inventory size of about 100,000 products, like one lakh products. And the retailer wants to do promotional bundling. Now, there are actually billions of options. This is an easy question, but a really hard answer because it's combinatorially complex, right? There are 100,000 choose two options. Now, even if I make this question slightly easier, I pick one of those products. Let's just say I pick sort of uh, these Doritos chips. And the question is, which would be a really good product to make a bundle with these chips? Well, the question sounds easier, but the answer is in fact not. There's still 99,999 options to choose from. Um, so the idea of this whole problem is that bundling is actually not a new question. It's a very well-studied problem, both in economics and in marketing. Yet with over six decades of research, we have limited principle guidance on for retailers on how to actually create good bundles. Now, to be fair, the literature does give us some useful starting points. So, for example, let's just say if you're buying um, a TV, maybe bundling something like you know, the, a Dish TV or Tata Sky along with it is a good idea. These are potential complements. Uh, consuming them together increases the joint utility that consumers get. Fair enough. Now, depending upon another product, for example, you are buying a uh, flavored yogurt, you're buying strawberry flavored yogurt, maybe you can bundle, for example, vanilla flavored yogurt with it. Both of them are potential substitutes, but may still be complements over time. So that's also a valuable starting point. Fair enough. Uh, I think these are valuable starting points, but both of them actually assume that the retailer knows which two products are complements or substitutes to begin with. That in itself actually is a really hard problem to do at scale, especially at the scale of hundreds or millions of millions of products, because co-purchases are very sparse and estimating cross-price elasticities for these pairs of products is really, really difficult. So with that sort of a background in mind, the question that we ask and answer in this project is how can we design principled and scalable methods that managers can actually use to create good bundles? And then we kind of have a five-step answer to all your bundling needs. This is the way we thought about the problem. It's also going to be an outline of the talk and we'll revisit this framework again and again. But let me just give you a quick intro of, of how we've thought through this problem. So we work with an online retailer and we have granular click stream data from that retailer, which means you observe everything that consumers do, what they buy, what they see and what they don't buy. With that data, we estimate something called product embeddings, which I'll explain later, uh, a bit later, but these embeddings are sort of, uh, one can think of them as approximations to understand which two products could be complements or substitutes. Once we have these embeddings, they kind of form our core ingredient in our big bundle design recipe. We come up with multiple bundles for a single product, and then we show them randomly to consumers on this retailer's website. And so this is kind of uh, uh, an experiment being done on consumers' live traffic coming to the retailer's website. Now, because these bundles are sort of randomly shown and designed by us, we can use them to come up with policies of what are good bundles. And then we can actually use it to extrapolate to other products that were not part of this experiment as well. 
Once we have all of this infrastructure set up, we then run a much larger experiment with this field uh, with this retailer that covers not only a much larger consumer base, but also a broader set of products. Now, admittedly, this whole process is a bit complicated. So I think it's important to highlight what's new here. Um, so a couple of things that we add to both the literature as well as to the practice of bundling, one of which is this whole idea of product embeddings. I think they're a fascinating tool to understand product assortments at scale. They're becoming increasingly popular in marketing. Uh, we've also done them with purchase data in the past, but we are the first ones to be able to incorporate both consumer purchase and search data to learn complements and substitutes at scale. This cool thing, I, what I really find about this project is we can actually use those embeddings to design better informed experiments in cases of large action spaces. Right now, most of the experiments that we see even in marketing or economics, they're like, hey, there's uh, a treatment and there's a control and there's a treatment and that treatment is typically like one option. Here, they're sort of potentially billions of options, right? I could create billions of bundles. Well, that will take a really long time and we can't really wait for us to experiment for billions of options, but maybe we can take a subset of those billions of options of bundles in a smart way so that we can explore this bundle space more efficiently. That's the whole idea of using embeddings for coming up with more informed experimental designs at scale. And then finally, we developed this end-to-end -end machine learning framework to solve a core marketing problem at scale. The paper is currently under review. Once it gets published, we'll make that code publicly accessible so that other researchers and retailers can also use it. More practically, we improve the expected revenue by about 35% of a pretty strong baseline policy. This translates to roughly, roughly of about $5 per 100 views to these bundles. And then we also have implement, implementable strategies that retailers can use. Our methodology is a bit technically complicated and we don't think every retailer is on that technological frontier. So we do provide off the shelf strategies that many retailers can then use. So that's sort of the overview of how we've approached this problem and what our contributions are. Let me just pause here if there are any questions. I think something in the chat or the Q and A is also blowing up so I can take those as well. Right. Oh, yes, uh, I can go to the previous slide. Uh, please let me know which one. Is it this one? Onuj, can I ask something? Yes, yes, yeah, I think I can do, yeah. Yeah, hi, so, uh, uh, so purely from an economic perspective, it can be simply technology driven as well, right? This bundle, in the sense that it seems like you are focusing on purely on the demand side. And uh, it's the, uh, so kind of the bundling is emerging as. The, which is driven by the choices of the consumers. Yeah, there can be potential cases where uh, partially it's kind of technology driven. So where a given computer may work, uh, you know, work the best with a given type of keyboard. It may, yeah, will see with some other types of keyboards as well. So the consumer will not know that. So they can yeah. purchase, let's say, you know, fake replicas. Yes. Uh, so that uh, would that create a bias here or I am right. off here? No, uh, fair point. Absolutely, Professor Jokbari. So the thing, so this whole machinery is designed to work with consumables, specifically grocery consumables. So I don't think we have sort of technological constraints in this case, which would require us to sort of filter the set a little more carefully. So typically this would be, for example, big box grocery retailers uh, in the US, the examples are like Instacart, Amazon Prime in India. Like, I think Reliance has their own grocery chain. You know, the average price of a product here is between nine to $10. So I think this is kind of the whole machinery is designed to work for products that have, I would say a very considerably more flexible, uh, um, I would say complementary and substitution pattern rather than those that have sort of technology constraints. For example, you can only use uh, a particular set top box with a smart TV that requires additional constraints, which our framework doesn't cover. But that's absolutely a fair point. So, uh, just a follow up question on yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, so, this is actually quite interesting because I mean, I would imagine at the first cut that a bundling would be kind of uh, proposed by the seller rather than the consumer first understanding that this can be bundled together. So are you really referring to bundle as a kind of uh, the way in economics you call it complementary? Or yeah. uh, is it something like in Amazon, if I go, they say that other consumers also saw this product. Do you want one? 
So which is not really bundling, but I don't know what is the marketing term for that. Is it yeah. thing like that? Right. I think um, so in sort of motivation, we are closer to the latter, the Amazon example, though we don't do it that way. So we do it kind of in the bundling way. But the reason we don't, to answer the first question of why we don't want to do it the seller way, so it depends on kind of who is facing the burden of this bundling, because these are discounts given, right? Now, in traditional economics literature, it's actually the seller or the manufacturer who kind of does the bundling. Uh, we are thinking of actually a little more, and the first case is, is more suited, I would say, for theoretical analysis, but that's not actually how it works in the real world. In the real world, the seller is kind of sell it initially to the retailers who are these downstream retailers and then they decide the promotional strategies for the end consumer so this is keeping those last mile retailers in mind where you go and buy with consumers buy product but the motivation is actually rather than saying you know if, if you only focus on for example the seller the seller will only want to bundle within their own products here the retailer can bundle across categories even using unrelated sellers as well so for example you could although it may not be a good bundle, but you could theoretically bundle, for example, shoe polish and toilet paper, which come from completely different things if consumers like to buy them. So we are kind of on that stage where we leverage what consumers see and buy to come up with smart bundling strategies, but keeping in mind that we're not sort of designing another recommendation engine. Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah, this is actually very exciting. I know that you're going in a different direction because it kind of indicates that you are developing almost a theory for endogenous product market segmentation as well. So uh, very cute. We what, what yes, comes we do have some, some theory on, on, on product segmentation. So that's a nice thing. Okay, awesome. Thank you for the questions. I'll kind of move ahead, but I'll keep, uh, you know, feel free to jump in with questions, but I'll also pause uh, regularly. Okay, so one thing to note about the, uh, what we have or the data kind of work, working with, it helps set some background. So we have six months of granular clickstream data from this online retailer in the US. You can think of this retailer as being a competitor to Amazon. They're definitely not on the same scale yet, but they do have the ambition of being so one day. Uh, we have about 35,000 products. They co cover a wide range of departments and categories from grocery, household health, pet, baby products. And we have about 500,000 users and about a million shopping sessions for these users. Uh, now, one thing about the data that requires sort of careful attention and which is pretty much what, what our entire methodology hinges on is the following. So what we observe is consumers buying a bunch of products together in the same shopping session. And what we are after is a method that allows us to make the following statements. One, coffee and milk are complements. Two, milk and cookies are complements. Three, chips and salsa are complements. In fact, we want to be able to go deeper and make stronger statements that coffee and milk are stronger complements than coffee and cookies, and the toothpaste and dish pods are sort of uh, idiosyncratic purchases to this to this product basket, and they don't they're not related to the other products. Now, this is actually pretty easy to make when I kind of line them out like this nicely, and I've hand drawn which two products are complements or substitutes. This is really hard to do at scale, especially when most of the products are never co-purchased together. And it's really difficult to estimate joint cross-price elasticities. So easier said than done. And we'll show how we sort of overcome this limitation. Now, analogously to each product basket, we also have something called the consideration set. This is everything that the consumers saw but didn't buy in the same shopping session. Now with this consideration set data, what we're after is a method that will allow us to make the following statements, that these three types of coffee are substitutes of each other. These three types of chips are substitutes for each other. Now, this is a fairly simple example, but the method is flexible enough to allow us to make statements like coffee substitutes tea more strongly than it substitutes Red Bull, for, say, for example. So that's the methodology that we are after. Uh, how we do this is using this idea of product embeddings. Now, if you're from sort of the economic bent of mind, one way of thinking of product embeddings are a coarse approximation to a giant cross price elasticity matrix. If you're more from the computer science way of thinking, one reductionist viewpoint for this is that it's just a fancy data reduction method, right? So either way it holds, uh, but we'll explain how it serves our purpose. So, I'll give an intuition of how the algorithm works, but the mechanics itself are a little more involved and optimized when we actually implement it on the data. 
So consider uh, our assortment of this retailer and suppose that it only has products from three categories, baby, grocery, and pet. What we do is we initialize these products completely randomly in a two-dimensional space, which means that I give them a random X, Y coordinate and I plot them here. In the actual algorithm, they are initialized in a hundred dimensional space, but we are not attuned to visualize hundred dimensions yet, maybe sometime in the future. But for now, we'll, we'll stick with two dimensions. So each product, uh, each point is a product with a random two dimension space. This is before seeing any data. Now I take in training data, which is the set of products people buy together. Once I see two products being purchased together, I move them slightly closer in this space. If I see products not being purchased together, I move them slightly apart. Eventually, as we pass through the training corpus, it this map reorganizes itself, or I should say self-organizes itself into something that looks like this. Again, each point is a product. The proximity of any two points reflects how strongly they complement each other. It's a heuristic for complementarity. It is not derived from sort of the structural parameters of cross price elasticity matrix. We can't do that. So we have this coarse approximation that allows us to make related inferences. So that's one way to think about it. The axes itself are meaningless. They are in sort of this virtual space. They don't have any particular meaning. The only thing that matters is how close any two products are to each other. Now, while estimating this algorithm, we didn't actually tell which product is baby, which product is grocery, which is household, right? We only give in hashed product IDs. This map is organized just based on the way people consume these products. It's sort of a self-organized way that it recovers the category structure that the retailer has. And we can dig a little deeper and probably that will make this intuition a bit more clear. So this is subsetting within grocery products. And we have sort of two well-defined spaces here. One on the right, which says that products from meat and seafood and dairy and eggs category that they strongly complement each other. And then the products on the left, which is basically candy, gum and chocolate and snack foods. Again, we did not tell which product belongs to which category. It's based in consumers' consumption patterns that we are able to recover this. Now, in addition to all of this purchase data, we also have consumer search data, which is all the products that consumers see but don't buy. And we run a separate set of embeddings there. And when we plot them, they look like this. Again, each point is a product. But here, products, these are products that occur in the same session that consumers don't buy together. So proximity of any two points in this space actually reflects substitutability. These are products that people see together, but don't buy together. Now, again, each point is a product and then proximity of any two points reflects substitutability. And we can see these well-separated islands of products. So for example, the one on the bottom here is sort of hot cereals and oats. Now this reflects sort of two things. One, we have way more search data than purchase data. Consumers search many, many products before they buy any single one. So we have just a substantially more search data that allows us to estimate these embeddings more efficiently. But it also reflects the fact that consumers search a lot within the same category before buying something and picking something. So we get these very nice islands. Okay. Now, I think helping this, it would help if I fixate on one particular, fix this on one particular example. So let me do that. And then I'll again pause for questions. Okay, so consider organic russet potatoes, which are like common, uh, commonly purchase brand of potato type of potatoes bought here. What I'm looking at is the set of products that strongly complement these organic potatoes. And we can see that it's basically other sets of organic products or organic vegetables, eggs, other types of sort of organic veggies and fruits. The score on the right is basically a strength of complementarity. It's the cosine similarity between these estimated embedding vectors, but the closer they are to one, the strongly, more strongly they reflect complementarity. That's the whole idea behind these. Now, for the same product, we can also look at substitutes. When we look at substitutes, it's basically these other set of products that, or other types of potatoes that reflect how strongly they substitute this particular type of potatoes. So other type of potato-based dishes or just other varieties of potatoes. And now what we've done is initially we had this set of 135,000 products. We weren't particularly sure which two products are strong complements or substitutes. What we have done is come up with a method that allows us to rank order products 
by their measure of complementarity and substitutability. Right, so this gives us a way to move forward in learning how any two products strongly complement or substitute each other, which then feeds into how we'll design the first set of bundles. All right, and this is a fairly complicated method. So let me just pause here. There'll probably be a bunch of questions. I'll address those and then I'll move forward. Don't be any question here, but I do have a simple uh, question for you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, one question is so, for example, I as a user come to the app or to the website and that becomes a session. So, whatever I search, so I'm assuming when you say consideration set, so the unit will be user session, right? Yeah. And it's not my consideration set. Suppose I log in right now. And then a new session starts, say, after 40 minutes, but you will consider it as a new uh, session. And the second thing is, if we are doing it even at a session level, sometimes what I see is also endogenous in the sense that I get recommended products and some people have the tendency to see more recommended products and rather than others. And Spotify people have also come up with quite a few papers on uh, recommendations. Uh, if people, there are certain people, if they follow more algorithmic recommendations, the way they search and do discovery on the app is pretty different from folks who don't follow algorithmic recommendations. So uh, I'm not sure if even that will have an impact on what you're doing, but just wanted to. Uh, yeah, no, both fair points. Uh, absolutely. And so I can uh, answer them in, in the sequence they were asked. So for the first, uh, absolutely right. So we work at the user session level mm -hmm. and then session is kind of defined as the industry standard, which means 30 minutes of inact inactivity leads to a new session. Everything that happens before that is part of the same session. So inadvertently we do, we may have some spillovers that go to the next session. There is no good way of sort of circumventing those issues. So one, you know, one thing could be, maybe we should take every day as a session. So either way, we have to make some sort of value-based judgment. Uh, I think here, what we did, we sort of stuck with the industry standard to make sure it applies across platforms. So that was sort of the idea. And this is the platform, you know, the industry standard for platform, 30 minutes of inactivity. The second one is actually a considerable, or could potentially be a considerable uh, uh, problem when a lot of what consumers see is driven by the recommendation system. There is sort of no good way to completely uh, get rid of the, uh, the recommendation system. We, what we do is we do our best to sort of ameliorate that issue. And the way we do it is all the searches that we take, they come from listing pages and not recommendations. So if you, if for example, you were on the page for uh, butter and then you were recommended uh, vegan butter, uh, we will not consider that as part of uh, what you search because that was driven by algorithmic session. So we only take what happens at the consumer listing page where you will either manually go click on the category for butter or you will type in the search page and that will release non-personalized listings of what you would like to buy because they are based on the availability. So that's, again, there's no kind of clean way to go around this, but we try our best to make sure we have minimum spillovers from recommendation systems. Right. Thank you. So this is an awesome paper. I have seen it when you posted it first on archives. So it's just okay. um, now you are here. So I thought like I have to ask. No, you. absolutely. Absolutely. Happy to answer more questions as well. Yes. Okay. Um, so sort of taking stock of, of where we are, we start with granular click stream data. We cut that into two parts, products that people buy, products that people see, but don't buy. On the first part, we estimate embeddings that reflect complementarity. On the second part, we estimate embeddings that reflect substitutability. These embeddings allow us to generate heuristics for complementarity and substitutability, which is this cosine similarity score that you saw before. And that allows us to come up with our first set of bundles that we can experiment with. And the philosophy behind sort of bundle design is the following. We take the embeddings and a bunch of sort of heuristic rules and come up with four categories of bundles for each product. So let me explain those and then I'll again, I can pause again for questions. So we have, we take a product, we come up with four bundles. The first one we take is the product that has been, has had, it has had the highest co-purchase rate with in the past. The idea here being that people have bought this product, these two products together in the past. We're now going to sell them at a discount 
people are likely to buy them again. So that's that should work. So it's kind of like a smell test that this approach is working. But another thing that what this is doing is that it now allows us to map the purchase of these products to these underlying complementarity and substitutability scores. And that mapping is what allows us to extrapolate to all the other products that are in the long tail of the distribution. So what we're really after is learning how people like to buy bundles as a function of these scores that we have. So the first set of bundles we make is uh, based on historical co-purchase. It'll help to fix with an example. So let's just say the product we're creating for this bundles was Domino Sugar. So the first bundle we make is this sugar, individual sugar packets with the big box of Domino Sugar. Now, this is based on raw co-purchase frequency. The second category that we make is cross-category complements. So we take the strongest complement for Domino Sugar and we create a bundle with, with that particular product. Well, how do we know which is the strongest complement? Well, we use the embeddings. We use the embeddings to rank order all products that are complements and we take the first one. If the first one conflicts with the previous category, we take the second one. Right? So that's how sort of this, this hierarchy works. Now, again, we, if, if you recall, we had this problem of potentially billions of options of bundles. Now we can't really experiment with all of them. So we want to be a bit more smart about exploring the space. And we're trying to use theory as much as we can to guide our search. So we start with co-purchase, go to cross-category complements. We add exploration by going to cross-department complements. This is bundling domino sugar with these plastic spoons. The sugar comes from the grocery category, the plastic spoons come in the household category, the household department. And that allows us to do this more principled exploration, but in a guided way so that we can learn how people like to buy complements or bundles across departments. The first bundle is based on just raw co-purchase frequency. The second two are based on these complementarity embeddings. And the last one is based on this consideration set embedding that allowed us to infer imperfect substitutes. So here we bundled Domino Sugar with this no calorie sweetener. Again, trying to learn whether imperfect substitutes could be maybe complements within a household or complements over time, or people just have this variety seeking behavior that they like to try different things. And then we can use that to our advantage to come up with better bundles. How this looks on the retailer's website is the following. You as a consumer go, you show interest uh, for this particular type of chips. What we'll do is we'll exogenously show you the bundle, which is on the bot bottom of, of the products page that you can buy the original product and the bundle product with a 10% discount of the second product's price. And the experiment is run at the user product level. So if you go, uh, to the Doritos page and today you're shown a particular bundle, you go there a week later, you're still always shown the same bundle for the duration of the experiment. And similarly, if it holds, if you're again on the Doritos page, you were first shown a variety bundle for Doritos, then you are continued to show that bundle for the particular length of the experiment. So that's how this is designed. Okay. Uh, some quick summary statistics. We have about 18,000 bundles. That's 4,500 products across four. Uh, about 11,000 got viewed. We have about roughly, you can say about 200,000 users, about 2,000 purchases and about $18,000 in revenue. But what's nice actually here is that we have this variation in how different products are purchased or different bundles are purchased based on which strategy they are created from. So just to sort of re um, uh, reiterate the whole thing, what we are not after is saying that, hey, variety bundles work best, that is what the retailer should do. A co-purchase bundle works best, that's what the retailer should do. What we want is to say for Domino Sugar, which bundling strategy works best? For Doritos Chips, which bundling strategy works best? For Vegan Butter, which bundling strategy works best? So we're not kind of after the average best, We're kind of after the optimal policy for any given product. And that's why sort of this whole machinery requires another step about offline policy learning. But it probably helps to take stock. Granular clickstream data, for products purchased together, products searched together. On products purchased together, estimate a set of embeddings that reflect complementarity. On products searched together, estimate a different set of embeddings that reflect substitutability. Use those sets of embeddings to come up with the pilot experiment of which bundles we can experiment on. We create four bundles for any particular product trying to explore this complicated bundle action space. 
We show these bundles to users. We observe what they buy, what they like, what they don't like. And now the goal is to come up with an optimal policy where we say for any given product, this is the best bundle that you can create that will maximize revenue. Let me pause here for more questions. Um, I don't see any question for now, but for me, okay. it's awesome. So. Sure, yeah, yeah, either everybody's asleep or nobody's interested, or maybe I'm explaining very well. No, Nikita, okay, that, Nikita, that, 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 that yeah. makes sense. This yeah. is very interesting, I'm sure, and you are explaining it in such a way that more or less things are pretty clear to people. That's why, yeah, Nikita. Yeah, I take that as a compliment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it's regarding the earlier section. Uh, so mm -hmm. I am assuming that each consumer session will have multiple search histories, right? Like I'll go yep. search for butter. I'll probably go search for chips. So yep. mm, but when uh, Professor Anup said that the unit is the consumer session, I wonder uh, how do you uh, put those search histories? Like does each search history make a consideration set? M when, uh, yep. Yeah, so that's my question. <laughs> Right, no, fair question. And no, each search history does not make a consideration set. All the search histories made within the same session make a consideration set. Now the question is, hey, you know, you're looking at butter, then you're looking at chips as well. And then, you know, in this in this shopping session, you end up also looking at bleach. Does it really make sense to combine to them? I'm just sort of generalizing your question uh, for, for yeah, the benefit yeah. of everyone. So the idea is what would happen, at least the way sort of consumer behavior works is that, we tend to do a lot of shopping trips, at least online that are, I would say, need specific. So we do a grocery shopping trip, a household shopping trip, uh, trip and, and things like that. So the idea here being is that, yes, when you look at types of chips together, you look at like 10 types of chips, they'll be part of the consideration set, five types of butter, part of consideration set. And if many, 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 many consumers do that, it's actually a reflection of that there's a relationship between these chips and butter. It's just that we haven't discovered that relationship yet. But if millions of consumers are doing it, there must be some, some sense to it that we're trying to figure out. And if we include bleach as well, that will most likely be an idiosyncratic purchase. So when we kind of aggregate over hundreds of thousands of users, it will show up as having no relationship at all. So that's, that's the reason we can combine everything. Another way okay. of thinking about this is, is, is as follows. So for example, look at this case of, if you look at this case of organic potatoes, what, if you think a little more deeply, what, what we are effectively saying is that any two products always complement each other and any two products always substitute each other. What matters is the degree of complementarity and degree of substitutability and how we infer that degree is based on how frequently consumers purchase. So for an example, we can make the statement that shoe polish and butter are complements, right? So we can make the statement in, in our framework that, that holds, but when we estimate the degree of complementarity, it will be very, very close to zero in effectively saying that the products are unrelated. Right? So this is the framework is designed that any two products can be compared using a continuous metric. It's just that if we realize that consumers, there's no relation between them, the degree of complementarity or substitutability will end up being very close to zero and those at the top will be those products that are actually related. So it kind of aggregates itself out across consumer sessions and purchases. That's the motivation. Okay, okay, makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Madhav. This is a very uh, interesting uh, topic. I just have a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. One is on uh, like, uh, so we also had in the literature, there are these uh, studies, right? Where they use product embeddings using this techniques like what to wake and others. Yeah. So how it is different from this, like in terms of comparison. And second is yeah. in the AB test, did you get a statsec uh, GMV lift uh, or something on those sort? Like add to, add to cards, I can see, but uh, like was GMV also tested? What does GMV mean? Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Gross, gross merchandise value. I mean, yes. yeah. Okay, yes. Uh, so two points, so uh, one, how are these embeddings different? They're actually not that different. To be honest, like this is among the first type of papers that were using word to WEC. Uh, and all the papers that you know you, you're referring to, they all came out at the same time, it's just we never submitted it. So like the candid explanation for that is it is pretty much the same methodology, but we never submitted it. So we are kind of not now the first in line, but we have sort of tweaked it a bit to make the algorithm more efficient. But I, I would say that for all effects and purposes, you can treat this as being 
pretty close to work to work, uh, barring the slight optimization routines that we think worked well for our data. So in, the, in, in that spirit, we are very close is the innovation from our part is being able to accommodate consumer search data within word to vec to learn both complements and substitutes. So I think in terms of sort of incremental or some progress upon word to vec uses in marketing, our users to be able to use search data as well. So that's the thing. And about sort of stat sig on the expect of the experiment. So it, it you know, this is it's kind of an untraditional experiment in many ways. You know, there's no control group when we say stat sig. We're like as compared to the control group, the treatment is so much better. We don't have a control group. And that's because the design is a bit peculiar. And I think one way to think about this is what we're trying to actually do is not sort of compare one policy with the other. We're actually trying to generate unbiased training data to come up with a better policy. So we'll eventually do that statistic uh, sort of evaluation once we come up with a better policy. This time, what we're essentially doing is we're doing this unbiased large scale training data collection to learn which bundles do consumers actually like. Once we learn that, we'll come up with a policy that we think is the better policy. And then we'll compare that to something that's a little more baseline. And that's where this sort of the traditional stat sig will show up, but it's coming in a couple of slides. Uh, there's another hand up, so I'll, I'll answer that and then move forward, yeah. Thank you, thanks. Yeah. yeah uh, hi, uh, I'm Rama, and yes, uh, I've got a question for you. I quite often wonder uh, in um, literature modeling uh, substitutes and complements that usually uh, people, risk, and I'm sorry that I missed the early part of your talk, so no, just pardon me if the question is uh, uh, returned. So what you usually observe is when you talk about complements, you talk about either two dissimilar items or any number of similar items, same items. So mm -hmm. uh, I uh, quite often wondered how to extend these things uh, to um, more than two items. So, you know, with some going to matrix notation or something like that, uh, I think that is uh, something that's quite missing in the literature. Yeah, and uh, whereas I think that's not that big an issue with substitutes, as long as the degree of substitutability is very high. Yeah, so would it be possible to attempt something like that in uh, this kind of a study? Oh, that's a very nice question. I, ideally, the answer is yes, but to be honest, I wanted to graduate and finish my PhD, so I kind of restricted it to two products. But it's it, the problem becomes uh, uh, here is that in. in, in, in it's really difficult optimization problem as the number of products that you want to optimize over that, that increases. So I think that's the basic limitation. Um, and so that kind of, that's the first limitation I would say on the computational side. The other limitation actually comes up when we want to experiment. So kind of the more finely we create categories, the thinner each category gets the power portion of the traffic which means we are quite likely to come up with underpowered experiments to learn whether this is actually a set of complements or not. So we kind of have this double whammy on both cases. It's, I, I know that people have tried to solve this problem in sort of an OR kind of a framework where there are kind of these optimization routines that come up with, hey, these set of products can be complements, but those have not been validated in the field. And I think the primary limitation of validating them in the field is that these experiments now require sort of millions of impressions per set of products, and that makes them really underpowered. But it's an absolutely fair question. I think, uh, you know, as probably I grow as a researcher, it could be something that I'll definitely look forward to sort of tackling a little more rigorously. It reminds me of my PhD days. I was working on bundling when I was about to graduate. So anyway, <laughs> fair, fair. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Uh, well, thanks for the questions. So again, taking stock of where we are, we've run the experiment, we have data. Now what we want to do is learn a more optimized policy. Now here we are actually in comfortable machine learning land. What we have is each individual exposure to a particular bundle. The bundle was shown randomly, and then we observe whether people buy the bundle or don't buy the bundle. So, and what we want to learn is for the next set of consumers, for any given product, which bundle should we recommend? That's the that's what we are after. Uh, so the way we do it is the following. So we take this sort of experimental training data and we split it up into a training and validation sample. 
and we want to prevent leakage. So everything for a particular product either goes in the training sample or in the testing sample. Right? And then we train a model. In this case, we train XG Boost because that was performing very well. But the model is basically taking these independent variables, which include the price of the two products, these complementarity, substitutability score, rating, brand, category, uh, how popular they have been in the past, and predicting whether people will buy them in bundled form or not. Right? So this is kind of like a very standard outcome model. We have training data. We have a bunch of independent variables. We can predict whether people will buy or not. What's nice here is that the training data itself is unbiased. It's not endogenous in a way that con consumers are sort of voluntarily searching these particular products because they like to buy them. We have exogenously shown them and then we observe whether they bought them or not. So the exposure is exogenous, which is kind of nice and allows us to learn this optimal policy in an unbiased way. So when we fit this model, this model is fit at an exposure level. And we do it in a cross-fitted way, which is basically for any particular row, we don't use the observation of that row to generate predictions. We use observations from other rows to generate predictions for a particular row. Again, data is at an exposure level. So for one bundle, we could have many, many exposure. Like, so 10,000 people could have been exposed to one particular bundle. And for any particular focal product, there are four different bundles. So for a focal product, there could be like 50,000, 60,000 users could have been exposed to them. So what we do is we aggregate the data from the exposure level to a bundle level. And then we call that the average success or average likelihood success of a particular bundle you know, across given these 10,000 exposures, 500 people bought it. So the average score is like 500 cross one, uh, 500 divided by 10,000. And this is sort of the average likelihood of success for a particular bundle. Now, for any given focal product, we then take the bundle that has this average likelihood of success. For any given focal product, we have four different bundles. For these four different bundles, we have many exposures. We aggregate those exposures up to a bundle level. So now for any given focal product, we have four rows in the data with each row saying, saying for bundle one, two, three, four, what is, the, what is the likelihood of success? And we say the bundle is the best bundle when it has the highest average likelihood of success within a given focal product. How do we know it's the best? Well, we were a little smart about keeping a portion of the data aside as testing that we didn't use, right? So now we can actually just use off policy learning to see whether it actually works or not, right? So the way this is for any given product, we know which is the best bundle. We can use that model to fit it on the, or to predict on the test data. And on the test data, we can select, hey, this is the best bundle. This is the one that should be recommended. And then while evaluating whether this was right or not, we only take those rows where our policy recommends what actually happened. And then we calculate the average revenue where the two match. Now, this is again a bit involved, so feel free to stop me, but I'll, let me show you the graphs and then I'll pause again. So each bar is a policy. The one on the left is the optimized policy that uses these embeddings and the trained XG boost model. The bar on the extreme right is a strong baseline, which only includes products that if they've been co-purchased in the past, they could be part of the bundle. That's a pretty strong baseline, but it's myopic. You know, if products weren't purchased in the past, it doesn't mean that they can't make good bundles. It's just that they haven't had the opportunity to get exposed to users. Maybe if we show them to users, they'll actually like to buy them. And then the question about SatSig, so the 35% revenue gain that we show for this policy is comparing the bar on the extreme left to the bar on the extreme right. And this delta is roughly $5 for each 100 bundle views. The two bars in the middle use either only the complementarity score or only the, substituted, the substitutability score. Again, saying that the real benefit comes when you actually use both the scores to come up with this optimized policy. Now, this evaluation is nice because it's completely, it's, well, it's not unbiased, but it's consistent. This is the Horvath Thompson estimator. So it's consistent uh, uh, under just mild conditions but it is restricted to the 4,500 products that were actually part of the experiment. What we want is a method that allows us to extrapolate to the entire assortment, right? We're not just the 4,500 products that were used in the experiment. Now, when we want to extrapolate, we have to depend on something, right? So you either believe in your gut, you believe in God, believe in some mystical force, 
we are believing in this XG boost model and saying that's how consumers buy bundle. So then we use that XG boost model to extrapolate to the entire assortment and say that it works. I'll walk us through this graph and then I'll pause the question. So what we do is the following. We create 1 million potential bundles for about 16,000 focal products. For any given product, we create like hundreds of thousands of bundles. Okay. Then we say, select the best bundle, either given by our optimized policy or given by our uh, co-purchase or sort of baseline policy. So the, the blue dots reflect those set of bundles selected by our optimized policy. The red dots select the bundles optimized by the co-purchase of the baseline policy. The difference between the two is the gain in revenue. Now, th three things to note about this. The products are grouped by how historically popular they have been. These are groupings of the focal product. As we go towards the right, we go towards less popular products. And as we go towards the right, the distance or the gap between the optimized policy and the baseline policy increasing. That's the reason why we have scalable in the title of the paper is because the true benefits really come when you scale to the entire assortment. Okay. Two, on top, there are these numbers written in green. This is saying the proportion of bundles within each bucket that are selected that have never been co-purchased before. So if we only look at products that have been co-purchased in the past, there'll be, that'll be a severely myopic policy because it will not even consider all of these good bundles that can be of value because the policy only consider products that have been co-purchased in the past, right? And third, this whole apparatus kind of works end to end, starting from a sort of simple click stream data to the point of coming up with this optimized policy in this sort of seamless end-to-end -end way. Again, we'll put the code online when we have the paper published. But let me pause here. I know I'm also sort of running short on time for uh, having the last 15 minutes. I'll pause here for question and I'll show a slide or two and then you know I can answer more questions in detail. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I got an observation. <clears throat> sure. Given that you have historical uh, uh, co-purchases in that, uh, I was just wondering, it would be interesting to think of the format. If the product is new, Right. You give an example of sugar. Let's say I'm going to buy milk and uh, uh, sugar substitute. Right? Yeah. If the item is new, I may not really know how good it is. And therefore, I might buy the one that I'm used to and yeah. the new one, showing them as complements. Yeah. However, after some time, they will become substitutes. Uh, so the same combination may become... Uh, complements or substitutes depending on when you purchase it. And conversely, we can say that when that happens, maybe the quality is now revealed. Earlier it was not or something like that. That yeah. kind of inference can also be made. Yes. No, absolutely. I think that's so uh, the first part actually reflects, uh, you know, if we were to focus just on the complementarity score and substitutability score, that limitation would become very apparent. That's why we kind of have this optimized score because Purchases are dynamic and consumer preferences change. So we account for both how strongly a particular product complements and substitute, substitutes each other. Excellent. And again, we, this is a little tricky as well because for some products we can never say. Let me give you an example being, for example, ketchup and mustard. Like, are they complements or are they substitutes? I find it like they're both you know, spreads that you put on bread. Some people like to buy them together and consume them together. Some people absolutely hate that combination. So precisely for that reason, we kind of have both these measures on how frequently people buy them together, also how frequently people consider them together, but don't buy them together and kind of jointly optimize over this space. Yeah. Yeah, more questions. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, yeah. So I'll, um, you know, another slide or two, I'll just pause and then maybe we can have a pre-flowing -pre conversation. So some bit about managerial insights. Uh, by now, I'm sure many of you are thinking, oh, this is like a bit complicated to solve a, a bundling problem. But yes, I mean, to make progress, we kind of have to push on many fronts. But we do want it to be a bit more accessible, especially to retailers that may not be sort of that technically sophisticated because the experimentation infrastructure required is fairly advanced here. Now, if you're just looking to start, we have a couple of sort of useful guidelines for you. So 
If you're looking to start to create bundles, you don't know where to start, we think this is a good place to start. So these are cross category bundles and our suggestion is to either start on the top left or the bottom right of this pyramid. So for example, make bundles between fresh produce and dairy or fresh produce and meat, pantry and dairy, they all will tend to work very well together as sort of predicted or validated by our model. Along the same side, if you have products in breakfast foods, candy, gum, chocolate, cooking, baking supplies, bundling them together is also a good idea in terms of increasing revenue. So that's a good valuable strategy to start with as well. Again, you know, these are starting points. It's a good place to start, but eventually you should, depending on the assortment that you have and the kind of consumer base that you have, you want to optimize over that. But we do think these are sort of fairly general starting points. Okay, so sort of with that in mind, let me just sort of give like a, a quick refresher on what we were after. We started with this big idea of how to create principled and scalable methods that managers can use to come up with good bundles. And the way we solve it is the following. We start with granular clickstream data. We cut that up into two parts, products that people buy, products that people see, but don't buy. On the first part, we estimate embeddings, which are these continuous representations of products in a latent space. These embeddings reflect complementarity. On the second set, we estimate a different set of embeddings, but in this space, they reflect substitutability. We use their combination to come up with four bundles for any given product and run a field experiment on the retailer's website where we randomly show consumers different bundles. The bundles are shown such that on the focal products page, you're shown one option to buy a particular bundle at 10% off of the second product's price. Now, once this experiment is run, we actually observe all this exposure data, again, which was sort of exogenously done uh, for consumers. And at that point, we're sort of free to use all other variables, all other free treatment covariates, the complementarity scores, the price, historical rating, brand, historical co-purchase, to come up with an optimized policy to say for any given product, which is the best bundle. This optimized policy increases revenue by about 35% of a fairly strong baseline. This was about $5 per 100, view, 100 views for these bundles. We show in the paper this robust across categories as well as it generalizes well to the entire assortment. That was the graph that sort of widened the gap between optimized policy and uh, the baseline policy as we went into the long tail of the products. And eventually when all of this machine, machinery is set, we validate it with a much larger field experiment that includes a bigger consumer base as well as a bigger share of uh, the retailer's assortment. And so the first, the paper is just till part till here. The second experiment is being sort of worked on. Uh, we already have the results. We're kind of writing that up, uh, but let me pause here and then you know, I'll use the remaining time to answer any questions about this paper or just the whole idea of, of using scalable machine learning, causal inference or anything else. Um, I don't see a question for now, but I have just one quick question. Maybe I yeah. skipped it somewhere. Um, are, you, are we somehow accounting for uh, the pricing part or the, because sometimes what happens is the retailers want to give a discount on one of the products and sometimes they bundle them together. Yeah. So is that something that we don't need to think about or is that something we have already thought of? Right. So um, kind of to, to cast this question also more broadly, you know, bundling is a two-part problem, selecting which products to bundle and then what is the discount you want to give mm -hmm. them. And both of them are sort of pretty hard in their own, own, sort of own right. The way we do is we, we fix the discount at 10% off of the product's second product's price. And the, only, the reason we did it at that is because that was sort of the average institutional level discount. And within a system, when you run experiments, which are as large scale, they tend to have spillovers to other products or other domains. So to kind of keep it consistent across the platform, we just kept it fixed at 10% off of the product price and then optimize over which product should be part of the bundle. Now. Unfortunately, in the first experiment, we don't have enough natural price variation to optimize over price. So the prices don't change that much. But in the second experiment, we actually ran for eight months, there's natural price variation. The proportional discount is kept fixed, but that does change the absolute value that of sort of uh, in dollars that consumers pay. And that allows us to optimize over price in the second half of this. So, so more on that is coming in the second or like the second experiment. 
Yeah. I see. Okay. Okay. I think we have time for uh, two yeah, questions, please. Professor Ramanathan. Uh, sorry, last uh, set of questions from my side. Uh, sure. the, uh, the the question is the 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 bundling decision is taken by the retailer, not by the manufacturers. Yes, it's by the retailer. The end the oh. end retailer. Yes. Okay. Uh, because otherwise there might be uh, some kind of games there, you know. Yes. Uh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Shyam, you have a question. You can unmute and uh, just one question. Uh, yeah. So when we work with this kind of data, right, especially with large retailers, when we have categories from grocery and gross much GM, right, like yeah. uh, various categories, how do you handle the noise? Because you would be taking the sessions data, right, and yeah. you are taking both add to carts and purchases, as far as I understand, uh, when you build the embeddings. So just wanted to understand what steps you took in the initial that data prep steps to clear the noise. Right. Thanks. So eventually, I think it's also, I think we haven't updated the paper on, on archive. Uh, so, so eventually these, uh, these embeddings are estimated on clickstream data at the session level and products that are only purchased together end up being part of the purchase set. So if they were added to cart and then removed, they're not part of this set. They are part of the products that were searched together. So, so that is um, um, you know, where the add to cart thing happens. But I, I'm, I think I would, I'm sort of generally sympathetic to the question sign that you're asking. This, this data actually fairly noisy. Uh, I think uh, we, because we had the retail partner working with us closely, we used a lot of heuristics that they suggested on how to kind of organize it a bit more cleanly. Some mm. of this includes removing the really extreme right tail of products, products that are very, infrequently bought products that are always on promotion you know some products have so if if nike is your really big customer nike will have special terms with you so then you probably don't want to use those products making sure we don't use products this is related to Andrew's question earlier that are being fed through the recommendation system so i think a lot of this requires judgment and that judgment is based i would say more on institutional knowledge than principles of data science. So principles of data science do matter in the sense that we removed our uh, uh, long tail products, but a lot of this benefit came from working closely with the retailer who said, based on their institutional knowledge, we were able to clean this up. And the earlier question was also about word to web. So it, it takes actually to write, so we have our own custom word to web that works on this kind of machinery and writing that and making that making sure that works at scale is actually really painful to be honest so it takes a while that's why this is you know it's a phd dissertation and and, and it, it took like takes like six eight months to kind of just get that algorithm running absolutely true true i understand thank you thanks for yeah. that yeah uh, i think there's one last question from nikita just sure. trying to understand can one also look at how discount rate should vary with substitutability score to increase revenue? yeah it's a very nice question okay so ideally what we would want it is the following we, or we wanted to make the following claim at the end of the study that for complements you actually don't need to give that much of a discount because people are going to buy them anyway the real benefit is just coming from you reducing their search cost by showing them up front and giving very minimal discount. Whereas for substitutes, you want to be able to give a much larger discount to induce purchases. So that's the statement ideally we like to make, but and this is one of the limitations of working in industry uh, and especially in, in retail is that you're not really allowed to experiment with price. It's really, really hard to convince them that we want to change prices at will they don't like it. So we kind of have to work within that infrastructure. And that's why the discount is fixed. But the second experiment will allow us to at least partially answer that, where we do optimize over price. We don't have enough variation in, or I would say enough experimental power to say the substitute should be discounted much larger than, than complements. That would require actually individual level product price variation. We don't have that, but we're able to at least make some optimization over price, but we, we're still sort of working through it. But I think that's a very nice question. Um, Unfortunately, because of limitations of working with, with the retailer, we don't have enough price variation to come up with a conclusive answer. Okay. Um, so we are right on time. And also, I don't think we have more questions. This is, as I said, a fascinating uh, paper. And um, uh, this was really, really great. Thank you so very much, Madhav, once again, for taking our time. And we really, really appreciate it. 
So, oh, thank you so much for having me. Yes, and if, if students want to reach out, please, uh, and Anjal has my email, happy to answer any questions. Uh, so yeah, please do not hesitate to reach out at all, for sure. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Thanks. Thank a lot. Have, a, have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. Thank you.